Uh, hello and welcome to this next session of our Good Web Festival. I'm Polly McKenzie. I am the Chief Executive of Demos and it's been a joy to work with Alex and uh, the others on this really interesting festival and the project we've been doing. So thank you for joining us thus far um, and a huge welcome to our guests for this panel, um, Arik Chowdhury, Rachel Caldicott and Carl Miller. Uh, so what we're going to be discussing here is unanswered questions. We might, by the end of the session, have got to some answers, but actually what we want to do is make sure we are stretching ourselves, really pushing the boundaries of, you know, the complexity here. The, you know, you start thinking about internet policy and you realise that there are so few boundaries, you can go so deep uh, into complexity. And, and often in our political life, we talk about the, the simple things simply because they're easier. So what I'm going to do is ask, first of all, each of our guests to tell me the thing that, even though they are enormous experts in this field, that still keeps them up at night, that still puzzles them, the greatest uncertainties uh, and unanswered questions around internet and web policy. I'm going to start with Arik Chowdhury. Arik is founder of WebRoots Democracy and a senior policy advisor for the Royal Society, where he focuses on data and digital technologies. So Arik, what, what keeps you up at night? other than the ghastly lockdown? Yeah, thanks, Polly. Um, it's a really interesting question. I think thinking quite broadly about the, the challenges of internet policy, I would say maybe the big unanswered question is, or maybe two, is one, how do you enforce any kind of desired uh, policy on companies which aren't even based in your jurisdiction and basically operate all over the world um, simultaneously? And then second is what do you do when some harms or some evils are just inevitable and there really is nothing you can do about it in terms of regulation. And um, on those areas, you can look, I think, at, or the way I would look at it, is to look at how we regulate things in the past or how we design policies for things like classical problems that are similar. So if you look at the enforcement challenge, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of work, a lot of reports and lots of frameworks around the ethics of tech, the ethical use of, of different technologies. But then ethics in um, you know, the offline world is a very real and tangible and enforceable thing. So it can be enforced through um, you know, university courses. So if you want to become a doctor, for example, and you study medicine, ethics is a very core part of your, your studies and you can be struck off a medical register, for example. Or an accountancy. I, um, you know, I used to be an accountant once upon a time. Ethics was very well embedded into um, everything you learn, and you're part of a, a chartered institute, and you don't have that obviously with um, technology. And on the inevitability of different harms. So let's say you take the example of online abuse, which is an area I've looked at um, at WebRoots Democracy. Um, there are lots of different things you can do that to mitigate online abuse and to like create better reporting tools or, or flagging up different content. But given that the in inherent challenge of the internet is that anyone and everyone can publish anything immediately, it's very unlikely that you'll ever wipe out online abuse. And therefore, you need to start thinking about other policies such as taxation, uh, such as um, longer term offline activities to, to combat some of the, the deeper issues, such as racism, sexism, structural inequalities. And those are very, very difficult to answer questions, which which is a broader question than internet policy. And so those are the, the kind of things I, I try to think about a lot, which is, you know, how do we actually view the internet as not a separate thing, but as something that's as part of, of um, general society and how do we enforce the kind of policies we would do in the past um, today. It's a really great uh, introduction, Arik. Thank you very much. I'm now going to come to Rachel Caldicutt, who is a, 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 an expert on the social impact of new and emerging technologies and director of a new research consultancy, Careful Industries. Rachel, what do you think the big unanswered questions are around internet policy? I mean, I the thing at the moment we've got really hung up on harms and like so i've been working in um the web for over 20 years and um uh, we seem to have become a 
um, fixated on mitigating things that might not happen uh, or that maybe happen rarely rather than encouraging people to do uh, uh, good things right it's become much more sort of policing oriented i think in the uk and that <clears throat> i'm kind of more interested in how we mobilize communities to create good rather than um penalizing everyone continually over the top stick um um, behavior of a few I think that's one thing and to the reek's point like a lot of the things that are wrong with the platforms are structural and to do with the business models and that it feels to me that what happens in this world where everything is connected there's a lot of complexity it's very easy to get hung up on like a specific that seems uh, fixable and really overdo it you know like if if we if we were really interested in encouraging Facebook to behave um, differently for the last 10 years um, governments all over the world would have been pressurizing the US not to allow them to acquire Instagram and WhatsApp and you know, and we're now seeing moves towards the breakup. But like it, it, it feels like, in a way, it's not as much an unanswered question as a unlooked for perspective, because what we are doing in the UK is we're carving things up through the niche of our government departments, rather than looking at the entities as they are you know and so really if you want facebook to encourage everyone to have better outcomes you get facebook to change the business model you don't make loads of arcane hoops for them to jump through you know and so i kind of feel like what we're doing in a way a lot of the time is we're bringing we're bringing kind of not quite the right paradigm to thinking about technology policy. And I suppose I would like to see a, a focus more broadly on talking about good and encouraging that and empowering people to achieve it. Like what are the structural levers to do that rather than what are the structural levers to tell everybody off all the time, I guess. I'm really struck by the phrase you used, easy to get hung up on a specific that is fixable. It's a sort of a uh, natural tendency of politicians, isn't it? Because who wants to lean into structural change uh, that might or might not have measurable impacts when you can just pass a little law to abolish a certain tiny thing, even if that doesn't work? Um, right. And can I uh, just add, like, the number of, of bits of politics see that happen because somebody has seen their teenager doing something right it's not really scalable i think so yeah. no it's really interesting that when i was in government working in the coalition uh david willits used to complain that the whole government was obsessed with uh small children and policy to do with small children because the prime minister michael gove nick clegg uh danny alexander all had small children george osborne all had small children and that he had teenagers and thought we should care about teenagers. And probably now we're at the stage where all the political leaders have teenagers. I, I think you're right. It, probably somebody should write a PhD about that. Uh, let's turn now to Carl, who uh, is one of the fantastic team at Demos, um, uh, an author, a speaker, a researcher, and a co-founder of Chasm, which is our technology hub at Demos. Uh, and, and now, uh, so, so much in the wide world that we struggle to bring him back. So it's a delight to have you here with us, Carl, today. What do you make of the big unanswered questions of the internet? Thanks, Polly. Yeah, a delight to be back. Hi there, everyone. Um, my answer is a little bit abstract, but given this is a think tank event, you will, you will all indulge me in it. Um, 
my big unanswered question is how questions are going to get answered. I will explain what I mean. So the kinds of questions that I'm talking about are the, the questions that every generation really um, always need to kind of find for themselves. These are the, the kind of settlements, the compromises, the balances, which are always struck um, as each new generation finds themselves in a new social context, a new part of historical concourse, and needs to work out how to balance different public goods against each other. Sometimes these public goods come into conflict. Um, and typically, the way that we've always balanced public goods is through a series of kind of processes and structures, which basically could comprise, I suppose, ultimately political debate and judicial and legal debate. And then all that squishy kind of cultural and intellectual activity, which happens around all of that, of course, of which this event is part of. Um, and we've kind of always seen this kind of like, you know, kind of complex, I suppose, of kind of norms and culture and political decision making and legal precedent um, as being the basic ways in which those compromises, messily as they are, are, are forged and reforged all the time. That is not what I think is happening increasingly now. Uh, and I will give, I will tell a very, very brief story to, to kind of try and elucidate my point. I'll, I'll, I'll take everyone back to the San Bernardino attack, if I may. If you all remember this horrible attack in the United States, um, many people dead. Um, and the wake of it, um, a, a conflict between Apple and the FBI. The FBI didn't know where there were other attackers. The, there was one attacker that was dead. They desperately needed to know. And in order to get that information, they wanted to break into the attacker's phone. Apple consistently disagreed and uh, consistently rejected um, the idea that, that they would let the FBI in. Now, th that turned into a legal case, of course, as you can imagine. Um, and finally, there was a legal judgment telling Apple to let the FBI into the phone. But the reason I'm telling you this story is that what happened next basically exposed the fact that that entire legal process was a sideshow. Because what both organizations had been doing was in addition to actually trying to find the legal right to do it, Apple had baked in end-to-end -end encryption, meaning it was impossible for them, to, um, uh, for them to follow the legal judgment which had just been made. So after the judge said, here's a legal order for you to open the phone, Apple said, we can't. We don't know what's on the phone anymore. We've made it technically impossible for ourselves to look into this phone. But then the kicker was that the FBI had also found a technical solution to the problem. They had bought a zero day vulnerability with Apple's operating system and broken the phone that way. The moral of this story is that Quite, even though we often think that the kind of new compromises and settlements are, are still being forged, I think, in the kind of arena of public debate and in the arena of the courts, what that story shows is that, is that often actually it's being forged somewhere else. And, and the best way I can describe it is in kind of dueling technologies, you know, that often square off against each other. You know, you've got privacy tech and you've got surveillance tech. You've got the centralizations of the platforms versus the decentralized networks and cryptocurrencies and decentralized infrastructures. Everywhere I look now in society, I see these fundamental questions of autonomy and the distribution of wealth and privacy um, being set less by the decisions which we're making in, in democratic and politi political arena and more by simply what technology is making possible or easy or difficult or impossible to have happen. And my, my kind of worry is that in the driving, that this can completely changes who's in the driving seat. Because however imperfect, at least in the courts and in law and, and in politics, we've created systems which are reasonably porous, reasonably open in different ways to have lots of people's views taken into account and for these compromises to basically be, you know, kind of drawn out of all of those views. But now, in these dueling technological confrontations, like we have tiny groups of extremely sophisticated, you know, um, often extremely well capitalized technologists working on both sides of the equation. Um, and, and therein, you know, whoever wins those particular confrontations sets the stage for what society looks like, you know. Is it possible to remain anonymous online? 
Like, that's not a question which me, you, or perhaps even most people watching this really have much of a hand in when it comes to what technology is actually being built. But that the answer to that will affect all of our lives profoundly. So to me, really, the question, the unanswered question is, you know, over the next kind of 10 year, years or so, are we going to find ways of stretching the kind of processes for answering these questions which we built onto the new realities which I, I, I've tried to describe? I think that's a great... Just waiting for Carl to mute himself. Um, I think that's a great moment to kind of come back to the other panellists because that's an extraordinary challenge, isn't it? If we think that, I mean, basically the conversations that you and I are trying to have about how we ought to govern technology and online spaces are essentially undermined by our inability to do so, for government to be unable to catch up, unable to set rules when it's technology that decides. What do you guys, uh, Arik and, and, and then Rachel, what do you, what do you make of that challenge? Uh, and if, if you do think it's possible for, for government, for democracies to adapt and be able to once again take a regulatory stance, how do we, how do, we do that? How do we get them to speed up? Yeah, no, I do agree with Carl that sometimes I, I feel we do ask the wrong questions. And um, one example of that is, is some research I did last year on facial recognition surveillance, where um, there had been a particular debate about racial bias in the technology. So there are a few papers in the US which basically said, um, we should stop using this technology because it doesn't work as well on um, darker skin tones. And therefore, um, you could pick up uh, people of color who are innocent as guilty because uh, the the facial recognition system doesn't recognize them properly. And that is a real issue. Um, and you know, it's, a, it's an issue quite recently actually with Uber, where there are a few drivers who are um, taking issue with Uber, firing them because they weren't recognized on their facial identification system. But the answer to that question therefore would be, well, let's make more accurate facial recognition systems that can recognize everyone, right? But that um, doesn't really answer the racial bias challenge, which is that with surveillance, that the bigger challenge really is about who is being targeted with different policies, why are different policies being designed, who is going to be on the, the watch list for these systems, for example. So when comparisons are made with um, stop and search and the disproportionate impacts of stop and search on uh, black and brown people in the UK. The challenge isn't necessarily that, you know, we don't have accurate enough data. The challenge is that there are certain policies designed and implemented and enforced in certain areas and for certain reasons, which lead to these disparities in policing. And therefore, if you apply technology on top of that, even if it's accurate, you're still going to have these kinds of um, biases replicated and you know, you've seen the same thing as well with um, different tools like tasers, for example, right? So tasers work accurately on everyone, but they're used very disproportionately on certain certain groups of people. And again, you know, following on Carl's point, if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. So the wrong answer for the facial recognition problem has been, well, we need more audits of these technologies. We need to know that they work accurately. But again, what you see from that is you have audits of First of all, the big companies, the big facial recognition providers who submit themselves for audit and not the ones who are just people at universities or in their bedrooms designing them and then selling them to different private uh, entities. Um, but you also then have a kind of marketing tool for those systems that do well and they can say, well, we were audited by you know, X government and we were found to be not racially biased, like you have the wrong kind of language used. Um, so I definitely think that's a that's a, a big challenge is actually asking the right questions and that's why I said at the beginning that we kind of need to take a step back a little bit and, and see the internet as part of a part of wider society and not see it as a separate entity because often a lot of the um, a lot of the solutions I think aren't going to be like little technical fixes here and there I think it's going to be much I think we need to have deeper sort of societal conversations and, and think about, you know, what kind of public expenditure can we do 
that might make facial recognition an okay thing to use in the future. And therefore you need to think about your priorities, which is, okay, we have a well-documented issue of racial bias and policing. We need to tackle that before we give them more powers or tools uh, to surveil people. And that obviously requires huge um, non-internet policy investment, right? And, and big, big policies on anti-discrimination and all of those sorts of things. So I definitely agree that, you know, we need to think about what are the right, right questions so that we can get the right answers. Rachel, do you have thoughts on this question? You know, is government ever going to be able to actually decide any of these things? Yeah, I mean, I I think actually it's a question of pace. Well, it's it's two things. There's a a question of pace, and there's a question of I think um, in the last twenty years, the lack of 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 technical understanding in governments has led to a degree of, of a capture and um, bewilderment you know and the number of meetings I've attended where people are, are kind of nodding along not understanding um, the acronyms too scared to ask because they don't want to look stupid right <clears throat> what that speaks to is that actually we don't have the right kind of expertise <clears throat> asking the right questions and un unlocking the right problems. I, I think that's one issue. But I, I think there's a more profound issue, which is that we're kind of caught up in this idea that innovators have the right to innovate and that we as a society need to catch up with technology. And I would kind of turn it around and I would uh, say, you know, why why are we not um setting big challenges and big um, missions to solve the problems that we have why aren't we asking technology to meet us as humans you know and so i i think the first uh, thing is 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 it's it's all kind of wrapped up together in terms of there's a lack of understanding. Nobody wants to look <clears throat> uh, retrograde. Nobody wants to look like they are turning away the economic opportunity that might come with an innovative thing. But, but that actually, you know, I think things would become a lot easier if there's a little bit of political bravery and there was an opportunity to say this is the world uh, we would like to live in you know and if um, your technology is not safe to operate in that world it isn't usable you know and so to me like <clears throat> if you if you like if we think of um, a facial recognition as something that is inevitable and that is um, going to happen but it's only going to happen when it works i think we're already asking um um, um, uh, 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 um the wrong things because we've had now we've had like 400 years of technology in industry we had like 150 years of people having arms cut off in the in the industrial revolution we've learned about the safety by design right we've learned about what happened in the early 20th uh, century when um vehicles went on the road and yet there's this idea that uh, the way that capital moves through technology is more important than human happiness. And I don't think we can regulate until we're able to come to a better settlement on that. And I think um, that's the key. Carl, do you want to come back on any of that? And then if anybody has questions, uh, please do share them. There's a Q&A chat to the right and right of your screen. We've had one question 
hear from Johnny Muir. So I'll ask uh, Carl to answer that as well, just whilst you're answering the first question I asked you. Because it's really about that. It, it, it's about the same question. Is it Will this come from government or will it come from outside? You've made the point that government is at least partially responsive to public opinion and uh, in a way that corporations are less so. Technological development is less so. But Johnny, I think, is asking the question of whether whether public movements through journalism, through education, that can shift what happens here. Thanks, Polly. Well, I mean, that, that, that's exactly my fear, really, is that is that what kind of like it, because a lot of this kind of, as Rachel said, kind of permissionless innovation is happening in the shadows. It really is like much less vulnerable or even visible to the kind of mass movements and mobilizations, which we kind of always relied on uh, to keep, you know, to keep stuff honest, really. Um, but I, I think both Arik and Rachel like did like a really good job there kind of unpacking the different layers of this problem. And I, 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 might, I might just offer a few, a few thoughts on those layers. So layer one is, um, as Rachel very rightly said, this question of pace, like we don't have you know th th this question that technology moves such that the, the 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 given body of regulation doesn't really answer the questions which technology is at that point posing that's that that's the first that's the first question of course and we you know we, we, we're pretty clear on i i think that's quite well understood as a problem now this idea that it's very very hard to work out how we pass regulatory frameworks and laws faster the second layer though is that even if you have that regulation does it actually like what is the power of states to actually enforce it in a meaningful way to shape the technology that's being built or how it's being used? And, and there, actually, the, the tech giants, to me, are the least of our problems because they are the kind of entities which are actually most vulnerable to and most and, and likely to, to, to most closely reflect the, the power of states, really, to change what's going on in the world. These are large companies. They need markets. Um, they have lots of employees. They've got arrestable directors. Um, you know, that actually, there's nothing, there's nothing inherently difficult in controlling a tech giant by a state. It's always scratched my head over the last 10 years about why it's taken us so long. But but I don't think that's, that, that problem's going to persist for another 10 years. I, you know, the, the regulation will be passed. I think it would have been passed if COVID hadn't have happened. Um, and, and when it does, the tech giants will, they, they will ultimately do what states tell them to do. But, you know, out there in the world, you've got far more difficult things to regulate than, than than conventional large companies. We've got open source software, we've got decentralized networks, we've got a whole generation of technology coming through now where there's no one to pick up the phone to. You know, I'm seeing blockchain based social media platforms where there is no company necessary in order to run it. We've, we've got a company that exists only on the Ethereum blockchain as a massive smart contract. It is a company with no legal impersonation at all that exists, its articles of association exist on the blockchain. Like we're nowhere in thinking through how these kinds of things can be controlled by states or even if they can be. And open source software, you know, the idea that a lot of this technology, which is actually deciding these important questions for us, can be spread, you know, and, and shared and copied and exchanged, you know, basically in ways which I think states will not be able to really stop. I have no idea then how regulation really bites, even when it does exist. And then, and then lastly, and 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 I think both Eric and Rachel touched on this brilliantly, is, is the idea of permissionless innovation. The, the idea that, that it, there's always been this kind of norm amongst, I, I don't know if it's a norm or lack of a norm, but, but there, there's certainly no one has to ask. Like you make the technology that you want. You know, and you make the technology, and uh, you know, actually, like, and and I'm sorry to the technologists here. You know, I, you kind of often think, okay, well, the, the people making the privacy tech or the people making the surveillance tech, you know, they they have will have carefully thought out, you know, deeply detailed philosophical ideas of how they're going to balance these difficult, common, you know, public goods together. No, they don't. These aren't priests in a cell. They haven't got any better idea than the rest of us about what the actual answers are here. They've just got much more ability to actually answer the question, but their answers aren't any better. So, you know, I, I remember having a debate with a open source developer who had made a piece of technology, I won't, I won't name the developer, which terrorists were using a lot of, and it was making it very, very hard to clear terrorist content off the internet. And it was a piece of open source technology. And you would have thought, you know, I was kind of posing questions like, well, did, you know, you must have kind of had a sense that this was going to be used in bad ways and thought about how you might have built the technology in a way to 
really resist those kind of misapplications? No, they, they, they you know, they, they, they hadn't thought that one through. Um, so, the, the, yeah, I mean, I, I guess lastly, then, like, the, 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 the worry is twofold. The worry is like both that like just normatively making these decisions further away from people is just a bad thing. Like for those of us that are Democrats and those of us that want powerful citizens, like that is, you know, like having these decisions so distant from us makes us less powered and makes us yet our lives are still shaped. So that's just like normatively bad. But also, I don't think the answers are going to be better because they're not tapping into the full talents and diversity of society. They're being answered again by very small groups of people that often are actually very similar to each other. Um, so how we what we do here, I, I really don't know. That's why I wanted to take this because, because you know, you, you said what keeps me up at night, Polly. A, a lot of what we often talk about doesn't keep me up at night, I think, as much as other people. Like, I, I do think the tech giants will be tamed. I don't think the tech giants are going to destroy democracy. Um, I, 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 you know, there's a lot of corporate malfeasance and bad practice, but but I think ultimately we've been there before and we will cope with that. But this, I really have no answers yet about what we really do about about this kind of innovation from the shadows. So we haven't had any further questions, um, but please do if you've got thoughts. Uh, we have, however, had a writing campaign start. I don't know if you've seen, Carl, a demand that you start your own podcast. It seems to me that there are now more podcasts than human beings. It's like it's like New Zealand and sheep. But nevertheless, uh, I'm sure we would all be delighted to tune in um, to hear, Carl. Uh, it's kind of the council of despair, though, isn't it? And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, Rachel's suggesting a sort of... Uh, a move, I mean, this is this is a sort of unkind characterization, but essentially you shouldn't be allowed to do stuff unless you can prove it's a good idea. Um, uh, uh, rather than that you should, uh, you know, it's, it's like the opposite of censorship. If you, have, um, if you have censorship where you're not allowed to put on your play or publish your book and until the censors have decided that it's a good idea versus the kind of the standard liberal operating model, which is that you do what you like until someone can prove harm. Is that the you know? Is are we talking about a scale of harm, which means we should be adopting that that precautionary principle, which is you know more that you have to get permission to do things, or are just being unkind I, to you, Rachel? I mean, I the thing is actually, I think a lot of it is because a lot of these technologies are not well understood. What happens? instead is the thing that is brought into is the narrative and so what that narrative is is one that makes it look ex exciting when we're sending um, rockets to mars right uh and shooting teslas out into space out of big massive penis shaped uh, rockets right people get excited about that right they don't get excited about due diligence and safety and i think there's something about we're actually in a period now where a lot of these technologies are not new now we're always like there's always a huge amount of interest in um, government particularly about cultivating the emerging technologies but what we haven't really been um, um, doing over the last 30 years is looking after the technologies that we have so like if we think about last September the Excel uh, spreadsheet um, debacle when um, uh, um, thousands of test results were lost because uh, someone in Public Health England had not been able to renew um, um, the license on their Excel since like 2003, right? And the the idea that we're talking about how can we um, deploy algorithms and AI and not update office is like absolutely ludicrous you know and so I think there's something about 
understanding that the sorts of technologies we're living with now they need to settle in they need looking after they need uh, maintaining we can't always be going to the the bleeding edge the whole time and then i i think once we start normalizing um and making it kind of cool to do the boring the stuff then actually the permission is more of a social contract than it is a form you know and i think that's where we need to get to where actually we we stop thinking that technology has to be magical and marvelous and uh, futuristic and understand like you know this is more powerful than the computer that they used to send the first uh the first um mission to uh, uh, um the moon like we are living in the future now it's amazing we don't have to continue racing on i think i do like the idea of trying to make health and safety sexy my my kids and i are going through the avengers movies at the moment and i feel like there should be an avenger for for health and safety the sensible one um i was very traumatized i watched iron man 2 last night and and elon musk has a cameo it's like a deeply traumatizing 15 seconds of of the movie anyway um yes uh, iron man uh, tony stark is probably not the uh, not the model for the future uh cool to do the boring stuff yeah absolutely Arik, what do you make of it should we just should we flip it so you have to get permission you know facial recognition technology for example uh whether you can prove if it if it's safe to use in a in a free society yeah i think yeah you can't really um I mean, who's going to give permission right so if you look at facial recognition systems all you need the barriers are so low to a lot of these things that it's, it's not really possible to have a system where you can just you know say disapproved vendor can create a set of technology and this person can't because they're all created by people who are you know you don't even need to go to university to to learn how to build a lot of this stuff so you can just build it yourself and that's the point I was trying to make around facial recognition is that the big companies will get audited. And like Carl was saying about social media companies, the big social media companies will maybe abide by regulation. But it's those smaller ones, those more anonymous ones, um, you know, they may be based in different countries outside of your jurisdiction, but still affecting people within your, your own jurisdiction. That you can't, there's no concept of giving permission to those people. Um, which is why I think we need to start thinking about what do we, what policy levers do we have for the inevitable, right? the inevitable, um, especially negative consequences. And in the past, we would always look at, you know, very big and expensive policies to deal with these issues. So if we look at healthcare, for example, or defense, right? Some of these things will, will eventually just cost money. So if we want to have a, if we want to have a society where technology doesn't replicate or um, exacerbate inequalities, you'll have to spend loads of money on eliminating those sorts of inequalities in the rest of society, right? So if you look at, um, trying to think of a different example. So if you look at the problem of misinformation, you can do lots of different things um, on certain platforms, which may work for Facebook and Twitter and other platforms and may not work for other smaller platforms. But you'll always still eventually have some sort of um, problem, I think, around misinformation in future. So what you could do instead, or alongside it, is think about, well, what do we do in the real world that actually equips people to, uh, you know, deal with these problems? And often, you know, people say this is media literacy, and I know Alex and Carl often say we can't have, you know, school teachers in one corner and then the tech giants in another corner, which I do agree with. But there hasn't been any real investment in media literacy in this country. If anything, when these companies like Facebook and Twitter were emerging, there was a narrative in the public domain that media studies was a nonsense subject at universities, right? So we're so far away, I think, from even getting the right narrative and understanding of what we should be prioritizing in education, and defense, and healthcare, whatever it may be that we need to address. Um, 
before we can get to understanding how these technologies won't make the problem worse. And something I've been reading about a lot recently since um, George Floyd and BLM is like the origins of racism. Like, why do we have these problems today? And often they come back from, you can originate basically back to people um, coming across different communities in Australia, right? Indigenous Australians and saying, who are these people? Um, are they even humans or are they other kind of species? And then you have a whole sort of categorization on top of that. And this is only kind of like a couple of hundred years ago. So categorization in itself is a problem, right? And then a lot of these technologies aren't, you know, like Carl was saying, no, no one's really thinking deeply about the technologies they're building. They're just building on top of other structural problems which have developed over hundreds of years that we haven't even begun to, to unravel yet. Um, you know, and again, this can come down to things like teaching history of empire in schools or teaching the history of the Brit Britain's relationship with Ireland or whatever it might be, right? very basic stuff that we haven't addressed yet. So very long way of saying that I think we should um, think about properly, like what kind of expenditure do we need to do in the real world that will address things in the long term and not just the problems we have in front of us today or tomorrow a lot of the future technologies are just going to be built on you know existing structures and you're not going to be able to have a way of permissioning certain things um some things will be unregulatable right so i think we need to start thinking much much more broadly about what can we do here in the uk to deal with some of these underlying issues really interesting so um alison uh has posted in the chat can we learn from other industries where the precautionary principle or at least slightly higher barriers to innovation is accepted and works like medical devices or, or environmental law? Are, are there models out there that we can that we can look at? Anyone? I mean, this is a particularly <laughs> thorny subject right now, isn't it? The precautionary principle versus the relative harm also in not acting quickly and decisively at times as well. Um, Rather than a principle, uh, uh, one thing that we haven't really spoken about, which I think is very important, is um, organisational reform. And I, th I think we can look at some industries that have kind of tried to change the way that they're actually organised in order to kind of meet the challenges which they see. Now, this is organisational reform is definitely one of these like not sexy but important questions which massively gets overlooked. Um, and I actually think often um, is, is, is much more difficult, of course, to do for politicians than um, bashing tech giants, for instance. But let, let, me, let me, Paul, if, if I might, just very quickly talk about one organisational reform, which I think is massively important here, um, and that is the police. Because this is the, this is the kind of thing where we actually do have a solution to part, like one of the chunks of this problem, which we could actually do something about, and we don't. So crime, half of crime happens online now. Uh, you know, it's it's the most common form of crime. Online fraud is the most common form of crime in the country. You're 20 times more likely to have your social media accounts burgled than your house. You're more likely to see the virus and all forms of violent crime put together. The crime on the internet, like anything on the internet, passes across borders without even realising it. And that, what that means is that the police now are now faced in investigating crime with the fact that they've got perpetrators in in one country, victims in a second and a third country, evidence scattered in a four, fifth and sixth country, uh, and they can't kind of go across all those borders and bring it, bring it into a courtroom. Now, our police force in the UK is organised in the opposite way to the one that you would, the, 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 the structure you would have to police cybercrime. We have 43 local constabulary, constabularies across the UK where the vast majority of crime is investigated and handled. Each one has a small cybercrime team, there is a struggle, I think, for local forces to kind of reach, even into you know, jurisdictions abroad which will cooperate with British police, let alone jurisdictions, you know, Russia, former Soviet Union countries, often where there is no cooperation with British police. The solution really is quite simple. Like we have to create a national police force body, like whether it's a national crime agency or something else, which is much, much better at international liaison um, uh, and it needs to investigate all 
cybercrime in the UK, um, which has an important international dimension as a victimised British citizens. Like, and not a single Home Secretary really has, like, I, I, I think, shown the least bit of willingness to actually take on this difficult problem. Like, and I, I don't, I mean, Polly, I'd love to know your thoughts on this one, because to me, it just seems like there isn't the political incentive to, for, for like, you know, kind of cabinet ministers to kind of deal with that kind of reform. And, and as far, it, it doesn't, it can't come from the police. Like, we're not going to get the chief constables to kind of be able to make a decision like this. This has to come from kind of top level political authority downwards. And I, I, I don't know why, but, you know, no one seems to have kind of like wanted to move on it. I think, I think you're right. I mean, we put out a report towards the end of last year called the Great Cyber Surrender, because that is essentially what we've got to. It's a situation that is akin to how crime against the person was policed before there was a police force, whereby it is for the individual to seek redress uh, if they can, if they've got the power to. And, and essentially by government, most of what happens online is tolerated crime. Uh, and it's just, it's eaten up in profit margins or lower profit margins that, you know, then affect prices and, and consumer interest that way. That, that there's no, I don't think there's any belief though that even a national government could fix it because the international dimension is so profound, as you say. But that's probably another conference. If anyone who's listening wants to sponsor another conference on uh, how on earth we uh, police the internet, we would love to talk to you about that. Uh, Rachel, I think, has thoughts on, on policing. Um. <clears throat> Not on, on that, but on the original question, which is like, are there models from elsewhere? And I did quite a lot of work on this a couple of years ago. And basically, one of the problems is, is that the software tends to be continually shipped. So if, for instance, you are in the NHS and you are testing a uh, a device like a, uh, a piece of hardware or a, uh, uh, a, a, a um, clock, for instance, you're likely to be certain it will continue to be the same over time and check it every year. But if you have a piece of software that is updated um, monthly, then actually it's very, very difficult to use the kinds of safety protocols that we have had tradition, um, um, traditionally to um, monitor things that are changing continuously and may change in ways that are not expected. And so like the other problem is that a lot of other technologies tend to be um, assessed against uh, 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 the safety impacts, but digital technologies are, are often QA'd against um, their own spec, right? They're not QA'd against the change they're likely to, to create in the world. And so it's like, to do that, what we would need is a, a, a whole industry of people who were checking and um, monitoring and there's probably some terrible way of using a uh, blockchain to do this i can't believe i've actually said that it's completely awful um but that it's like it's not as easy to use the methods we've had previously to m monitor things that are completely changing or, or um continuously changing which is the reason i think narratives about what things are meant to achieve are more important than hard and fast rules if that makes sense I'm not sure it does that's really helpful and an important um, important reminder of you know I, I often the social media companies say we don't but they do profit from a frictionless model and allows them to do what they like and allow the uncensored traffic of information onto their site. And that's what enables the bad thing to happen. So it is one of their externalities. It's just that, you know, it, 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 it I don't know, sort of um, reminds me of Paradise Lost, but that's probably a whole blog post for me to write someday. Um, 
Oh, Reek, I think this is one for you. We've had a, there's been a discussion in the Q&A between uh, 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 Nicola, Stephen, around this question Carl raised of, you know, how do you resolve the fact that people aren't, aren't necessarily as, as media literate as, as we might hope they would be? Stephen suggests we should have a sort of BBC of the internet. And it does strike me often with lots of these conversations, it's a sort of policy or, or turn to everyone always says, let's put it on the national curriculum. But of course, you know, even if that were to work and make people perfectly media literate, it would still be a 70 year plan before the 18 year olds have turned into grown ups. So, or at least all of the grown ups. So, what, you know, what can we do in terms of media literacy and understanding to tackle the asymmetries of information about the harms that are being caused or the externalities of people's own behavior? Like, what would that look like if you, you know, if you could sort of do anything, spend as much as you like, what would you do? Yeah, I, I really like the idea of um, BBC for the internet. I mean, I don't know how that would work in, in, in practice, but I like the idea of even having a conversation about it. Because I think over the past um, you know, several years, I've been looking at these sorts of issues. There hasn't been any kind of radical discussion of alternate models for doing the things we do now, right? So there, isn't, there hasn't been any real conversation about a public social media platform. Um, there hasn't been any real conversation about taxation, um, taxing externalities of these platforms, which are all quite big and radical and expensive ideas. Like a public social media platform would obviously cost billions of pounds, right, in practice, and if you wanted to try and replicate the kind of things that Facebook and, and others do. Um, so I'd definitely like to see some sort of conversation around what that could be, and I think that could be a good route actually for providing media literacy the difficulty, I mean, I'm probably not going to give you an answer, I'm just going to highlight the problem some more, but the difficulty with media literacy is, um, you know, you could do it for people who are in full-time education, and that could be things like, um, you know, teaching them how to um, report certain things online or how to fact check or how to spot a deep fake, those sorts of, those sorts of practical measures that they can take, which might help them, you um, when they you know go on the internet or it could be things like um teaching principles of civility so another area which, would, which again would probably be a whole other session would be the, the sort of concepts of civility online right and the kind of almost a lack of shame i would say in in the sense of putting out false information i mean you see this across all sides of the political spectrum where parties will just publish blatantly false or mis miscontextualized information because there are, there are no real consequences for it. So that that's possibly the easier bit, right, is people who are in full-time education. The more difficult bit is everyone who's left it. And in the past um, kind of pre-modern internet, the way you would try to influence adults on social issues would be through, um, you know, television, right? So the, the four or five main TV channels, perhaps it would be a, um, you know, major storyline in EastEnders, or it could be something that comes on before or after a major program. Um, but now, obviously, you have hyper-personalized uh, media consumption. It's very difficult to uh, sort of feed those sort of social issues in. You know, how do you, how do you navigate what goes onto Netflix, for example, or make it popular and make it seen by the people who need to see it? So I think that's, that's much more difficult. Um, but not impossible, right? It would just cost a lot of money to do so. It would cost a lot of money to reach adults in the same way that we've tried to reach adults on coronavirus, so that people stay at home, so that people wash their hands or, or whatever guidance it is we want them to understand. Um, and there hasn't really been any kind of conversation on that. The, the kind of conversation on media literacy has been in like recommendations of think tank reports, which say maybe we should look at media literacy or make it put it on the curriculum. And then government ministers might say, yes, good idea. And then it never really materializes for various reasons. Or it's just provided by individual charities who don't have the resources to do it justice. Um, but I do think in practice, it would be practical guidance for navigating the, inter the internet and then some sort of reteaching of civility online that I think is, has been lost a little bit. So I'm very uh are cautious that we are falling into the trap rachel identified for us at the beginning which is that it's so easy to get sucked in these policy discussions into uh 
specifics that are fixable because it's so much more uplifting uh, to think about the resolvable problems like media literacy, which, as Arik says, sort of feels like, yeah, big, concerted effort, cross society, complicated, but at least achievable. And that's so much more uplifting than thinking about Carl's point of sometimes you pass laws and it doesn't make a blind bit of difference. So we're all powerless. So let's give up. Um, so it, with Rachel's words in mind, but so that we end this on an uplifting note, it, I just want to come back to each of you and say, is there, given that there is so much of internet policy that is still so complicated, what is the one thing that you would just hack off and fix if you were, you know, king of the world for a day? I'm going to ask uh, Carl first. Because Carl is the most cynical and depressing. I'm not, I don't think I'm that cynical or depressing, Polly. I try and no, no, you're just a pragmatist. And, and you're just a pragmatist, the but the pragmatism and depressingness are kind of quite synonymous when it comes to technology policy. I think. Yeah. All right. Well. Okay. Here's one. Um, I would create the Royal College for Algorithmists. I think we need a new professional society Like we're talking about permissionless innovation. Well, let's make it permissioned innovation a bit more. And, you know, there's, there's plenty of professional groups that have um, quite clear ethical understandings and, and memberships, you know, about what they can and can't do. Um, and we could put some of those principles, like a kind of like, you know, a Hippocratic oath of sorts into the kind of um, into the kind of uh, Rachel's going to disagree with me uh, into the kind of technology which can be built. Um, but but I absolutely think that, like in the same way that you know, like accountants and lawyers and psychologists and lots of other like professional groups have particular kinds of power to do harm and to reach into our lives, which we've recognised and built institutions to respond to. I absolutely don't see why we can't do that here as well, or at least certain kinds of technologists working on certain kinds of technologies. They should there should be professional standards. So Rachel, I think we come to you to find out why you disagree with Carl. I won't. I mean, um, <clears throat> more that um, a Hippocratic oath is. I mean, to it's 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 a it's too vague. And where does it begin and end? When you look at who in the product, who is making products, who holds the potential for harm, it is the business. Um, manager before it is um, the data the scientist. If you go to uh, Google, they will tell you it's the product lead, right? It's not, but I'm not going to get into that now. I'm going to answer the question and I'm going to say I would, um, I would be into breaking up monopolies and um, stopping uh, um, uh, um, early stage ac acquisitions. I think that is the most powerful uh, um, thing that would make the greatest change most quickly. Great, and to you, Arik, for the final word. Yeah, so my own personal opinion, not a Royal Society policy or anything, but I would like to see um, an effective tax policy for social media companies or, or tech giants generally and with a, with a view to spending that money in the offline world so we can uh, deal with some of the deeper uh, structural inequalities and issues that affect what happens online in the same way that we do with climate change and, and carbon emissions or um, road use or smoking or any any other kind of public health issue we take a tax and spend model which we don't really have i, I think yet with the internet yeah well we need to measure the externalities and then charge them for them polluter pace. Guys, that's been such a brilliant discussion uh, and, and we've raised lots of questions, but I think solved a couple too. Uh, and fortunately, there's a whole rest of the day for those who still have questions that they want answered. Thank you for those who've contributed on the Q&A and uh, in the chat. And thanks for participating in the Good Web Festival and for being part of Demos. Um, do stay in touch with all of the other work that we're doing. Take care.